Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Purified by Fire. I am David Cease, and this is the spiritual coaching show to help you find peace, love, and joy in family and work life, sanctifying the world one soul at a time. We are here each and every week to help you grow spiritually, to become successful in this life, and to be a saint for the life after. No matter how broken you may be, God is calling you to greatness that only you can fulfill. So come join us and see how he may be calling you. Hello, everyone. This is David at the Fairfax Studios for another episode of Purified by Fire. Today's episode is about obedience and how do we obtain the obedience that is, not, is so needed in today's society. Obedience to our country, to our church, and to our family. True obedience that gives us peace and is really freeing. I am going to teach you in practical ways how to become more obedient and to assess yourself to see if there are any areas you need to improve. These are lessons learned in the Marines where instant willing obedience is required. But before we get to our story, I'd like to open up with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to be more obedient, obedient to your will, whatever that may be. Help us to be obedient to all the things that you've given us, the authorities and those people around us, whether it be government, whether it be the church, whether it be in our own family. Help us always to listen to you and think of them as you are. You've given the issues and the orders that we may do them wholeheartedly. Let us pray. O God, who made the Bishop St. Ambrose a teacher of the Catholic faith and a model of apostolic courage, Raise up in your church men after your own heart to govern her with courage and wisdom through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my story begins when I was in the Marines. I got into this huge, huge fight with a fellow recruit when I was in boot camp. The, this this uh, other recruit was probably about six foot, um, I don't know, he was probably like six foot three, six foot four maybe, and I'm five five, I'm, you know, maybe five five, but, I, uh, but close to it. So he had about a foot over me, and we were in the showers. And before I explain the whole story about this fight, I want to explain to you about pa- uh, Paris Island and boot camp real quickly to give you kind of the insights and and what the drama is playing out when I got into this fight. So a couple of things about boot camp you have to understand is that, one, is that there's three phases in boot camp. The first phase, uh, second phase, and third phase. And they pretty much, you know, sum it up to about, I would say first phase is about five weeks. Second phase is the shortest phase. It's about three weeks. And then the other, you know, four to five weeks is – the third phase, which is the last phase. And so you're through those phases, you go through certain emotional uh, development, I would call it, uh, during those three phases. And the first phase, in the first phase, every recruit down there is scared, nervous, and, um, you know, they're just worrying about themselves. They're just very scared because it's new, they've heard stories, and they're thrown in this environment where they have to act like a team. They're being yelled and screamed at. They're being embarrassed. You name it. And so the emotional feelings that you feel at this point is just basically fear. You're, you're afraid. And so when the drill instructors yell, you jump. And uh, not knowing what to do, you just you know, jump around. Second phase, though, um, so this is about you know, four to five weeks later, and you get into second phase. In the second phase, your emotion starts changing. You start getting angry. Because by this time, you're about five weeks into boot camp, 
And when you're five weeks into boot camp and you're in a highly stressful environment, you don't get a lot of sleep, you don't get a lot of, uh, you know, food to eat, uh, you're kind of starving, you don't have a lot of time, you're constantly on the move, um, and, and uh, can I say there's no sleep? Um, I keep saying that over again. Uh, it, it wears on you. It really does. You know, you've got other recruits telling you what to do or you're telling other recruits what to do, and it wears on you. And, you, and in that phase, fortunately it's a very small part of the phase, you can feel the tension in the platoon. You know, the platoon might be anywhere from 60 to 80 uh, recruits, and you can feel the tension. Because by this time, the fear has left, okay, and you're just, you're on edge. You're just totally on edge, and anything could trip you off, and uh, there are fights that occur at this phase. You know, other recruits are getting you in trouble, because remember, when you get, when someone makes a mistake, the whole platoon uh, fails. You know, uh, there's this uh, tradition, I don't know if it's a good tradition or not, but they used to have these things called blanket parties where, you know, you would beat up other recruits, you know, to get them in line. So it, the tension is really, really, really high. So um, third phase, though, by the time you're in third phase, you are no longer afraid, no longer angry. You're just a killing machine with no feelings. You, the drill instructor could tell you almost anything to do, and you would do it. When they tell you to jump, you jumped. You didn't care how – you didn't ask, oh, well, how high? You jumped as hard, as fast, and as high as you could, and that's what you did. So at third phase, you were instant – we call it instant willing obedience. You know, we have to always say discipline, and the drill instructor would say, recruits, what's discipline? And we used to say, sir, discipline is the instant willing obedience to all orders. Instant. Doesn't mean I can contemplate about it. Doesn't mean I have to think about it. Doesn't mean I can argue about it. No, it's the instant willing, the key word, willing. Not that, oh man, I don't really want to do this, or I'm tired, or, you know, I think this is impossible. No, it's the willing obedience to all orders. And so when you get to third phase, there's nothing that phases you. We could go to combat. I don't care if people were, heads were being blown off, we would be instantly willing to obey the orders that were issued to us by our sergeants. And that was the level that we were at. So my story really begins in second phase, where in this phase, the tension is high. The other thing I want to talk to you about is the fact that in boot camp, you're playing leadership roles, okay? You're the squad leader. You're the fire team leader. You're the guide. So the guide would be uh, in charge of the whole platoon, and the uh, squad leader would be in charge of 12 other Marines, except for, uh, including himself, would be 13. And a fire team leader would be in charge of three other Marines. And so, but the, the, the thing about this leadership role is that you don't have the rank. Typically, uh, you know, the guide would be a senior sergeant, maybe even a staff sergeant, uh, a, uh, a um, Squad leader would be at least a sergeant or a senior corporal, uh, and a fire team leader would be a corporal. So in the real world or in the, in the fleet marines, you would be having the rank, which would give you the prestige and the power, the authority to lead these marines in the position that you're on. But in boot camp, we were thrown into these positions, and we, were, we, we don't have any authority or prestige. We're just recruits like anyone else, all right? So we, we have no authority, yet we have to tell these other recruits to do things that they don't want to do or care to do or tired to do. So with that in mind, we are in uh, the shower room. Now, the shower room is a fairly large room, and they don't have any, like, curtains. It's all basically just shower heads popping out, and the whole thing is open. And so I was the squad leader. Okay, I was in charge of 13 recruits, and oh, I'm sorry, three recruits, uh, 12 re recruits. And the drill instructor goes in and he barks out these orders to me. And we had field day. Field days, you have to clean your barracks. You know, to every week, you have to clean your barracks, top down, has to be sparkling, everything's clean. So my squad, which I was in charge of, was responsible for cleaning the head. 
which is the bathroom, which included the shower. And so the drill instructor had us fill this big garbage can, you know, those were like 30, 40 gallon garbage cans, filled it up with water, filled it up with soap, and he goes there and he looks at me and he says, recruit these. I expect this place to be immaculate and clean. And he kicks this bucket full of soapy water all over the place. And he says, you're going to use the soapy water. I want everything cleaned in here. So I was like, okay. So I go over and I start issuing out my orders to my fire team leaders. Okay. And so they go off and they issue their orders to go and clean. So some of the Marines went into the toilet. Some of the Marines went into the sink. And some of the Marines went into the, I'm sorry, Marines, but recruits went into the shower. And as a leader, we're taught that we are supposed to go and, and go around and make sure people are doing their job. So I go into this, the shower, and the recruits there, they're doing the shower, cleaning the shower. One of them decides he's not doing it. He's just standing there doing absolutely nothing. So I go to the recruit, and I said, hey, man, you've you got to start cleaning. We've got to clean it because we don't have a lot of time. And the drill instructor is going to come in. If we don't get it done, you know, at least our whole squad, if not the whole platoon, is going to be in charge. And he looks at me with this, these angry eyes. <clears throat> and he starts yelling and screaming at me, just yelling and screaming and saying, I, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this you know, place. I'm tired of everything. And I'm tired of you. And I'm like, whoa. And I just said, look, we, we need to clean. I know we're all tired, and we, we just need to clean up so we don't get in trouble. So I started walking away from him, and he starts getting, you know, even angrier and starts yelling. And now he starts yelling things about me that were very derogatory. And so by this time, I had walked, you know, I would say at least maybe 10 yards away from him. And I turned around, and I had it enough, and I was already on edge. And I start yelling and screaming at him. So we start going in a yelling and screaming match at each other. And all the other recruits are watching, and they keep just saying, guys, the drill instructor is going to come in here, and we're going to get into deep trouble. So I start, I keep yelling. And then eventually we say, you know, he says, you want a piece of me? And I said, do you want a piece of me? And we, uh, we run at each other really hard. Now, I, I played football. Uh, really, you know, and I know how to run and, and get a hit. And I, the other guy, I, the other recruit, I think also played football. Now he's like six foot three. I'm five foot five. And we just run. I'm literally running as hard as I can at him. He's running as hard as he can at me. And we hit each other really hard. But because we're on soapy water, we hit each other and we bounce off and we slide back to the corner. By this time, the other recruits. Two of them jump on me, two of them jump on the other recruit, and we're just yelling and screaming at each other and, you know, uh, you know with, with other recruits holding us back. And uh, finally, you know, I just said, like, lick up me. I'm not going to fight. I said, but you better get this place cleaned up. And I walk out of the shower. Lo and behold, we did clean everything up. It was all cleaned up. And, you know, we got everything done. That night, that evening, that recruit came up to me and said, and he apologized. He actually apologized, and he said, you know, he says, I'm sorry for the way that I acted, and, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And I, and I looked at him, and I said, I know. I said, we're all on edge right now, you know, and we, we need to really, really act like a team. And, you know, from then on, he never had any issues. So obedience, we're going to talk about that after we talk about the great fight that I had at Paris Island. So if I to say, I, I can almost venture to say that the drill instructors knew what was going on, but like anything else, they allowed us to settle it out. So obedience, how do you create this obedience? You know, as, as Marines, when we worked through Paris Island, we went from a fear state to a state of anger, and then lastly to a fear of, of nothing. Fear of nothing, you know, no emotions. It was just pure, instant, willing obedience. 
to all orders. That's what it came to. And then I would go to infantry school, and uh, it was called MCT, which is you know uh, not um, real infantry school, but it's it's another uh, part of infantry school that we had to go to. And then others went to advanced infantry school, where I went to my artillery school. And um, and we acted more like a team because we, we we did we were trained at Paris Island to be like that, even amongst same similar ranks. Okay, so how do we get that type of obedience okay so before we talk about that I'd like to talk about why is obedience so important why is obedience so important well the first reason is because uh, we talked a lot about in the past two Fridays about sub delegation all right and I, and I call sub delegation obedient authority all right so even though when I was a captain of the Marines and I had all this great authority and power to lead other officers and enlisted, I still had to be obedient. I had to be obedient to my superiors. I had to be obedient to their commander's intent and to their, uh, what they wanted to do. So I had to be very, very obedient to that. So no one has true authority to do anything. Even the President of the United States has has to be obedient to the will of the people who voted him in and to the laws of the United States, okay? And most specifically, his ultimate authority comes from God. So we definitely have, you know, in any type of authority, this obedience that we have to have. So without this obedience, government would be chaotic. There would be chaos, and there would be anarchy. So it has a very practical usage, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, or whether it's in government, right? So we are, we are to be obedient. So even authority has a level of obedient authority. The next is that it gives us, uh, I call it, it's, it, it really helps us to be worry-free. I like to be obedient because I'm just worry-free. When people tell me what to do, I just do it. I don't worry about it. You know, if, you, if you've ever been a leader, you know, like me, I, I run a business, I, you know, it's, it's amazing. When I do charitable work, I just did soup kitchen last weekend uh, feeding, I do not like to be a leader. I just like to do. I just like to do, uh, just not think about it. Just tell me what to do so I don't have to think about it. I don't have to coordinate it. I don't have to do anything. In fact, the lady who, who I do the soup kitchen want said, is I want you to be the leader of my team. And I said, oh, I don't want to be a leader. I just want to do. I just want to be obedient. That's all I want to be. And so it's worry-free. You just have to do it. The second is that it's a doorway to humility. Humble people are obedient people. Obedient people are typically humble people. Okay? And I can tell you, that disobedient people are not humble people. I can tell you that, all right? I know it from the military. I know it from work. I know it in my family. So disobedient people are not humble people. And humility is the entry into all the other virtues. In fact, humility is a gateway to becoming holy. Without humility, you cannot become holy because you can't even exercise even the virtues. And the doorway to humility is obedience. Okay? Obedience is, uh, you know, uh, the entry into humility. All right? So it's amazing. You know, being a Marine or being a Navy SEAL or all the elite services, they're the most obedient people you can ever think of, yet they're told to be very prideful. They're proud people. Marines are very proud. I'm proud to be a Marine, and so are all the other Marines that I know of. And yet we're very obedient because we know that there's a certain things that we have to get done, and yet there is a certain sense of humility that we have in that being pride, proudful about being a Marine or Navy SEAL or whatever elite and special forces that you're in. The, the lastly is that humility, um, being obedient, opens the door to do God's will and becoming holy, okay? That's what it does. Now, I want to read something to you. This, is, this is, comes from Maximilian Kolbe, 
Okay, uh, I'm summarizing Maximilian Kolbe here. So Maximil Maximilian Kolbe says this about holiness. Okay, this is very important. Holiness. He says the essence of holiness is doing the accord with God's will. In other words, our will has to be united with God's will. Okay, that's basically what the definition of of holiness. All right, when our will is united with God's will, that is, you know, holiness. The soul that deter determined that his will be one with God's will, okay? The fulfillment of God's will is love, and love is the very heart of holiness. It is only in obedience do we find the merit and essential quality of holiness, okay? So, why do you need it? Because you cannot unite your, your will to God's will if you can't be obedient. Because in essence, you have to be obedient to God. So if you can't be obedient to man, then how can you be obedient to God? You can't. You know? If you can't be obedient to your pastor, to your boss, your government. What do you think? That magically, that you're just going to magically become obedient to God's will? No. That's not going to happen. Because one reason why is those people who are, on, who are superior to you is God's will. God willed this government to be okay over you. God willed that, that pastor be your church leader. God willed that the Pope be the leader or the bishop to be the diocese. Does that mean that the Pope and the bishops are great people? No, it doesn't. But God willed that. And if we can't be obedient to that, then you're not being obedient to God's will. Okay? Great saints were obedient to some of the worst people you could ever think about, whether it be pastors, whether it be priests, or whether it be what, whatever. And they were. Okay? So, obedience is the doorway to holiness. The doing God's will, which then brings us holy. So this is how important it is. Two things I want you to understand. Obedience is a doorway to humility and opens the door to do God's will. That's the most important. Okay? And being obedient to human beings Humans are important. Why? Because God wills and his authority has been given to these people so that you can be obedient to them. Whether it's your parents, whether it's your uh, boss, whether it's your, uh, the government or your pastor, your bishop or, or Pope Francis even. Okay? And God willed that. So by being disobedient to them, you're being disobedient to God. By being obedient to man, you have now exercised and flexed that obedience to God. You're open to his will. So that's why obedience is so important. So what is obedience? I'm not going to uh, go in-depth about that because I do talk about that in my other podcasts. Uh, underneath justice, when I talk about, uh, I think I believe it's, uh, I forget what episode it is, but it's uh, part two of justice. But I'm going to recap a couple of things about obedience because I think it's kind of important to, to talk about it. All right. So obedience, uh, it's when uh, one's will uh, is prompt to carry out the, the commands of a superior. Command here means both the will of the superior and the command itself. So it's uh, your will doing it, okay? Okay. Um, real, uh, there's a difference between real obedience versus material obedience. What's the difference? Well, real obedience is when, you know, you actually are willing to do this, okay? As opposed to material obedience is when you are, you know, you're doing it, but inside, you feel like, oh, I really don't want to do this. You know, I really don't want to do it. Okay? That's called material obedience. And real obedience is not the same as material obedience. 
So our objective is to get to real obedience, the kind that we were like when we were in Marine boot camp on third phase. There was no rebellion in us. You know, if, 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 our, if our sergeant said, go attack that hill, and there were machine guns shooting in there, right, down our throats, we would have done it. No rebellion, no thinking of like, you know, you know, sergeant, I might possibly get killed or injured or I might sprain my ankle, okay? None, none of that. It would be, aye, aye, sir, and you go do it wholeheartedly, willingly, okay? So that's the level of real obedience that you want to be, okay? And, and so that I want to, you know, understand, you know, to explain that, you know, the material obedience is, yes, you still do the task, but inside you're like, ah, I really don't want to do it. This is so bothersome, you know, or, or whatever, okay? So that's not real obedience. It's just called material obedience, okay? All right, um, so the other thing about obedience is, is there are three grades of obedience, okay? There's the mere external execution, all right, which has very little merit, okay? Believe it or not, uh, as Catholics, you know, there's very little merit. Even, even if, you know, we do it and we're disgruntled, that really does not merit anything. So a good example of that is my kids, right? I tell my kids, go take out the garbage. And they're like, oh, dad, I got to take out the garbage. And they dig out the garbage. They still take out the garbage, but they're just like, oh, man, I, I got to do it, okay? This is, oh, jeez, oh, man, you know? That is just purely external execution and has very little merit, very extremely little merit when it comes to holiness. The next level is internal submission of the will, has intrinsic merit of the sacrifice of merit. All right? Now, what is the, in, you know, the internal submission of the will? That means that the submission of the will means that I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to grumble, okay, about it. And I submitted my will to do what he wants me to do, okay? Now, that has some merit, and it is a sacrifice. But the next level above that is internal submission of the intellect, the judgment. Now, that has, you know, that has an infinite amount of, of merit. So not only are we conforming our will, but we're also conforming our intellect, okay, to it. Now, what does that mean, okay? That means that only between God and man can we get to that level because that's really – because only God and man can, can know each other well, okay? Man and man can't. Uh, you know, I, last time I can't read another person's mind. Um, you know, I don't read my superior's mind. I mean, sometimes we can, we we do really well and we work well, but but really the intellect assents to God uh, in in such a way that the will it flows from the intellect to the will and then to the execution. Okay. So when I was a Marine, we we were at the will level. But our intellect level was just a blank. We were like a computer, okay? But in, when we talk about God, our intellect can ascend to the higher great things, spiritual things, up to God. And when those spiritual, when we ascend to God and, and, and our intellect goes there, then it, then it freely goes down to the will, okay? So at that level... That has tr- great merit because you're uniting your will with God's will, okay, while the other first two, the execution and then the, uh, the um, submission of the will, man, you can do that with other people, with, with man-to-man uh, or human-to-human uh, will. So, but but uh, if a priest does it and you're still at that will level and you do it out of, out of the ma- that still has merit, but the, the highest merit is when we can submit our intellect and our will uh, and, and execution. That is, is it, okay? So, for example, when we say, you know, I'm going to do it for the love of God, my intellect is saying I'm doing it for the love of God and, uh, and I, you know, taking out the garbage, and then we submit our will, our intellect, and our execution all to God. So 
that's what what really really is obedience. So obedience. Uh, what cause? Just remember is minimally is uh, uh, a a willingness. Okay, or an emergency we would say instant willing uh, to all orders. Okay, and not grumbling and doing that. Okay. So what causes us? Well, before we we talk about that, uh, what causes not to be obedient, I want to talk about what obedience is not. And I think a lot of people get confused about this, okay? Okay, oh, okay. this is what is not obedience. Being a yes man. That's so important to understand. Being a yes man is not obedience, okay? Now, what I mean by yes man is just doing anything willy-nilly because the person does, you know, tells you to do it. You know, because we know for a fact that certain things are immoral, right? If, if my parents told me to uh, steal uh, money from, um, you know, a cashier's drawer, I'm okay by being disobedient to that, okay? It's, it's, you know, that, and actually it's not even being disobedient because you're just being obedient to God who's ultimately the authority and uh, and that's what you're doing. So you're really being obedient, but you're being obedient to God, because at that moment of time, you, your parents uh, issued what we call an immoral, which means that he, they have no authority to tell you to do that. Okay, we talked about that in subdelegation. They have no authority at all to tell you to do that, because they lost that authority in that moment of time when they w- went against the authority of God which is thou shalt not steal, okay? So you're not really being disobedient as you are being obedient to, true, to the true essence, which is God himself. So being a yes man, okay? Uh, all right, the other thing is being able to do everything, okay? There's physically not enough time nor capability for every man to, be, to do everything, Okay, and in those cases, you have to say no, right? Uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, my wife says to me, you have to do 10 items in, in one hour, and you know one of the items is going to take you three hours to do, you know, you don't say, okay, honey, I'm going to go do it and then fail, right? You're going to have to talk and say, I, I can't do this. This is, this is physically impossible to do, all right? In fact, a lot of times, most people have a tough time saying no. Uh, people who have uh, uh, an over-service-oriented uh, virtue, and I, I, I'm actually one of them, you are susceptible, in this case, to say yes to everything, and what happens is they start failing. So you've got to learn to say no, okay, because you can't do everything. There's not a lot. There's... We're not God. There's not an infinite amount of time. There's not an infinite amount of space. There's not an infinite amount of knowledge that you have to get everything done. So the true essence of, of the intention is to give them feedback saying, I really can't do this. And I used to tell, say this to Marines, and I, and I even say that to, to employees. I used to say, a no is good as a yes, because the worst thing you can have is a person to say yes and not do it, Okay. Because that's also a sin, right? Because uh, you're lying. It's a, it's a, you're basically lying. You're saying, yes, I can do it frivolously or not looking, you know, frivolously meaning like you're not even thinking, doing any thought, uh, and then uh, saying, yes, I can do it, and then failing short, okay? So uh, you can't, all right? So those are the things that obedience isn't to clarify, okay? Not, not to be a yes man because there are certain things you can't do, all right, because they're immoral, and not being able to do everything, because you're a human being and you can't do everything. So what causes us not to be obedient, all right? Uh, the, one of them is control, okay? Control is probably one of the biggest things that occurs and causes us not to be obedient. Uh, hands down, controlling is, is probably one of the leading things. Now, what causes us to be controlling? Okay, what causes us to be controlling? Well, the first is FUD. 
fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Okay? That's what we call it, FUD. And most of the time, FUD is, uh, Satan is the one who's talking to you about FUD. Satan uses our imagination to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt. When I was a, a parent, you know, I was really, you know, no, no one teaches you how to be a parent. No one teaches you, you know, when you have your kids, you know, even though I had a really good father, you know, there's a big difference between my father and then you executing to become a father. And, you know, I was the fourth child, and I will probably say that most likely I probably have such a high regard for my father because he probably perfected fatherhood by the time he got to the fourth child because it's the same with me. It took me my fourth child, you know, thank God I, I, have, uh, I have six children because I did mess up on my first two. I was probably too hard. I was too harsh. I was many, many, many things. Why? Why are parents so paranoid? You know, there's the joke that, like, you, know, you can always tell a new parent from, an old, you know, from a parent that's, that's been there for a while, you know, the new parent syndrome where they do everything perfectly. It's because of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you know? They don't think that, you know, uh, they don't know what they don't know, right? So it's fear. And I'll give you a couple examples. One was my son had, um, you know, 103-degree temperature, and he's burning up. He's being, like, all lethargic. And my wife and I, we're, like, in a panic. We're like, oh, my goodness, the boy's going to die. So we call up our pediatrician. This was in the middle of the night. Pediatrician's on the phone. And basically, the, I think it was a man who says, you know, just throw him in, the sh uh, in a w lukewarm, uh, in a warm bath, and then give him some Tylenol and Motrin, and he'll be okay. And as sure as anything, we gave him a warm shower, a warm bath, and he sparked back up, gave him some Motrin, went to bed, and he was perfectly fine. Well, Chris is to say, the next day, okay, we, you know, we knew what to do, and we didn't panic, all right? So that's... That's an example. But here's a better example why we're controlling. So, you know, and, and, and fear, uncertainty, and doubt came on. So, you know, a lot of parents who bring their kids to church, all right, they're all, like, shushing their kids, and they're all, you know, doing all these things to their kids in, in, in church. And, you know, why? And I remember I, I, when I had young kids and I, I did the same thing, it was because we, I was afraid of things like, what are they thinking about me? They're all looking at me. They're all, you know, I must be a bad parent for doing this or whatever. All right. And most of the time, my kids weren't even noisy. They were just kind of you know, talking maybe a little bit or chattering a little bit, you know, doing those types of things. And I would be all nervous fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you know? So we become controlling. We're controlling our kids. Oh, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Now I have my kids, and I'm just like, okay, whatever. If they make too much noise, they go into the crying room. If they make a little bit of noise, you know, whatever. You know, we want to be that perfect parent. That's what we want to be. We want to be perfect. So we become controlling because we want to be that perfect. Because we don't want to be that imperfect parent. Look at that parent, you know? Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Until you realize that there is no perfect parent. Okay? There is no perfect mother. There is no perfect father. There's only the father, mother, and parent that tries, that improves, that will fail, but learns from them and grows. But most importantly, loves their children, teaches them about love in their own actions through service and obedience to each other. That's what's important. Not making sure that, oh my goodness, that they're dressed properly, that they're this, that they're that, okay? That they sit in their pews perfectly, all right? It's their children. So fear, uncertainty, that, that, what's, that's what probably causes most of our controlling nature, okay? The other is, Thinks you know that uh, that you know that that they know it all, all right. How many people think that they know it all? I know better. I know better than that. You know, there's a better way of doing that. Oh, that's so ridiculous. People who have that ideas, you know, like I, I know better, 
and think of better are typically the people who also then criticize. You know, Ugh! You know? And when you ask them to do something, they don't do it. Even if you ask them, what is that better idea? Oh, I don't know. Okay. So thinking that they're better. Now, you could say that they're prideful or whatever. That's, but there's a difference between the, you know, that, that they're prideful, but the habit, they have to break that habit of you know, thinking that, that they know better. Okay? And, and down the road, I'm going to teach, you know, teach or at least give you some examples on how to do that. But really, if you're constantly thinking that you're, you have better ideas, or you're constantly criticizing, you know, someone else, that has to stop. You know, that really has to stop because and that's causing you to be disobedient. Because as soon as someone asks you to do something, oh, you know, you know can you take out the garbage? Why do I have to take out the garbage? You know, why can't I wait until tomorrow to do the garbage? Because that's your idea. You know, instead of your parents saying, no, I want you to take out the garbage tonight, you know, so that we don't have to worry about it in the morning that we're in a rush. Well, we have plenty of time, Mom. We, we, have, we have plenty of time to do the garbage, you know, in the morning. And plus, I'll be awake, and, and I can just do it. No, you won't be awake, okay? So obedience. So you're thinking you have a better idea, okay, and, and doing that and criticizing the other person for why that's a bad idea, right? So that's, that's another reason why uh, we, we, we are, we're disobedient. Okay? I call it the know-it-all uh, ability. The other is arrogance. Okay? Arrogance. Now, um, people are naturally arrogant, arrogant. And when I say arrogant here, I shouldn't say arrogant. I would say self-centered. And I don't mean in a self-centered way, in a way that, uh, that they're evil or bad people. Some people are naturally self-centered. Okay? And uh, because they have their... their they're naturally self-centered, they're also become naturally arrogant, which then becomes a naturally, they become, they have what I call superior uh, complex, okay? Uh, that, that work is below me. I don't do that type of work, okay? It, some people are very susceptible on that. You know, you ever find people who just, they'll do anything, but other people are like, no, I, I don't do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. Okay, it's really uh, it's it's because those types of people are somewhat self-centered, okay, and that self-centeredness can lead to arrogance, and then arrogance of of course will lead to what I would call superior. Like I'm above that, and I can't do that. No, I can't do that. All right, and and that's really really hard. You know, the Pharisees were like that. Okay, they were very very into themselves, and Jesus was saying, you know, you gotta get outside of yourself. You know, uh, you know, you got to get outside of yourself and think, you know, of others. And we'll talk about that as well. So, um, you know, the other is my way or the highway. That's it. It's my way or the highway. All right. And again, that goes back to almost like I know better. And I, I've done this millions of years. And this is it. My way or the highway. That's it. If you want my help, it's my way. Okay. Um, not, not your way, but my way. So those are the things that causes us to be disobedient. Okay? That's really what it is. And we need to break those bad habits. We need to assess ourselves, where are we at? Where are we in this spectrum of bad habits? And then create in us good habits, okay, that occurs, all right? So how do we do that? Okay? So the first thing I want to talk about is controlling your emotions. Okay? Controlling your emotions. Just like we did in Paris Island. Right? In the begin first phase, we were scared, we were nervous, everything you can think about. And we just did things because we were scared. That's what we were. Deep down inside, we never conformed our wills. It was just we were nervous, scared, and we just did it. And then in second phase, we were angry. Angry because we were tired, we were sick, we knew better. Everything, every emotional thing, roller coaster you could think of, we just did not want to do it. And we were able to overcome that. Because in third phase, 
our will was united to the sergeant's will. We could do anything that he wanted to. He told us to do 100 push-ups, we do 100 push-ups because we were also in great shape as well. But we also had the will to just do it, just to obey, all right? That's what it is. So I want to talk to you a little bit. So that's what we got to do and get our emotions out of there. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit down the road. Uh, uh, but just suffice to say, we need to control our emotions, all right? The other, uh, you know, whatever those emotions, how it's sprung up. Because our emotions and our, our FUD is brought about by us thinking that we know better, by us uh, don't like doing something, you know, so we argue, we try to get out of it. You know, we think it's a waste of time, and this is beneath me, okay? Uh, you, know, I, um, you know, I'll read you, uh, no, never mind, we'll go there. So, so how do we, we uh, get obedience? First of all, we have to um, just do. We have to just do it, okay? Remember, as the Marine says, discipline is the instant willing obedience to all orders. That's the level that you want to get. You just do it, all right? All you're assessing is, is this morally acceptable or not? Can I do it or not? Other than that, you don't argue about anything else. Just do it, okay? Okay, um, no matter if it's a good idea, bad idea, right? You know, and here's the something, right? When, these, I, when someone tells you to do something and ideas start popping up like, I have a great idea, you shut it off. Shut that off. You know why? Because everybody has a great idea. You know, there's always six million ways to do something. But you know what? Someone told you to do it, you just do it. Um, fear. How do we calm our fears, you know? Most of our fears, 99.9% .9 of our fears are very imaginary, and they never come to fruition. I'll give you an example. I remember when my, my son was real young. And he was probably about like seven years, I don't know, five years, two, three years old. And he goes to the terrible twos where they say no, right? And I remember the first time my oldest son said no. I got so angry. I was like, you don't say no to your dad. You know, you don't say no to your dad. The child is two years old. He's naturally going through the two terrible twos. He's not willing to say two. He's not reasoning to say two, Okay. He's just saying two because he's going through the terrible twos. That's it. And so what my mind was thinking was like, oh, my goodness, if he says no to me and I'm his father, he's going to become this, like, you know, this criminal, you know, when he turns 18 years old because he can't accept authority. And so I was hard on him, you know, because as a two-year-old, he should never say no to a father, right? I'm sure all parents haven't gone through that. That's controlling your emotions. And you look at yourself and you say, man, the kid's two years old. He's going through a phase. Okay? Just like teenagers. All right? My teenager girls, all right, are just going through a phase. One of my daughters, she was going through her teenage year, you know, she still is in her teenage years. And I, I think I just said to her, like, okay, you can't go to this person's house because we, we had a commitment. And because of hormones and everything, she just starts bursting out crying and starts saying, you know, you're not allowing me because blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And she's, just get your, she's getting all worked up. And finally she says, and that's why you don't love me. And she runs in the door and slams the door. And I was like, wow, how did we get from – Honey, we don't have time to go to this person's house to, I don't love her, and then slamming the door. Meanwhile, my wife goes, you need to go in that room and talk to your daughter. And I looked at my wife, I said, no way. I'd rather be in combat than talk to my daughter like that because I know it's the hormones that's talking to her, okay? So by this time, I was a more mature father, and I'm not thinking to myself saying, oh, you don't say no to your dad like that. You're just disrespecting your father. You know, I just said she needs to calm down, she needs to calm her hormones down, and tomorrow we'll talk about it, okay? And then the next day, 
she opens up the door. She's like, hi, Daddy. I love you. And you're like, wow. Where's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde here? So the point I'm getting at is it's our own fears and uncertainty. And if you just trust and not fear, things will work out. Trust me. I ran a business. I have six kids. Things will work out at the end of the day. Maybe not perfectly, but it will work out. Okay? Um, everyone has great ideas. You have to learn. To, some people like me are great problem solvers. We, I, my brain is always going at problem solving. And we have to shut that off. We really, really do. Even though we're trying to be helpful, it really is against the grain of obedience. It really is. You know, hey, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. And meanwhile, you're, you're spending what, a half hour trying to figure out the most optimal, best way of doing something rather than just obeying and doing, okay? So just do. Just do it, okay? Don't ask questions. Just do it. I mean, certainly if you want more clarification to help you do it, that's fine. But in most cases, just do it. You know, my wife says, uh, David, can you take out the garbage? Yes, honey. Aye, aye, honey. And you move on. That's obedience, all right? You know, if you want more clarification, certainly. But just do it. Focus on just doing it. Don't think about it. Don't do it. Just do it. And that is what Marines do, and that's obedience. Second is silence, okay? In our society, we have to talk. Talk, 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 all right? Silence. I go on an annual silent retreat, okay? Obedient people typically are silent people. Now, when I was in the Marines, the, my best workers were typically silent people. You know, didn't ask a lot of questions, just kind of just did it, all right? Silence. If you're talking a lot, most likely you're not being obedient, all right? So, and when I say talking, I'm not talking like socializing or something like that. I'm talking about like, you know, if, if someone tells you to do something, you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, but, but you know, this, this. That means you're not being obedient. You're either arguing, you're discussing better ideas, solutions, and learning to be silent will help you learn to control when to talk and when not to talk, when to just do and when not to. So silence, you know, and prayer, a good prayer life will help you get silence. Muscle memory, okay? Just keep being obedient. Do things. I do uh, charity organizations, uh, soup kitchens. I always always try to do the job that no one else wants to do, the most menial hard work with less prestige. Why? Because most of us want to do the ones that are, oh, yeah, I'll do the things that make me look really good because I'm doing the soup kitchen, you know, or oh, I, I, I don't want to do that dirty work, okay? I try to do the, the work that no one else wants to do. Because that helps me to be really obedient, okay? Whether it's cleaning the toilets, whether it's cleaning uh, the dishes, whatever, it's taking out the garbage, I find and I seek out the ones that no one else wants to do. And that helps with the idea that I'm better than everyone else. Oh, that's above me, okay? So we really, really need to do that. And that creates muscle memory. That creates uh, this, this experience that you have. Okay. Uh, trust. Okay. Trust is the most important thing to reduce FUD. Trust in God. Trust in other people. Yeah, people fail on you. You know, that happens in life. All right. I mean, I probably fail my wife every once in a while, but no one's perfect. No one is perfect. All right. So trust them. You know, as Marines, we learn this to a T. We have to trust, okay, that someone else is going to get their job done. You know, as a platoon commander of 60 Marines, or let's say as a Marine, as a Marine, I'm one Marine in a defensive perimeter amongst other Marines. If those guys on the right flank do not protect their area, the enemy's going to go behind me and someone's going to shoot me in the back. 
But I have to trust that they're going to do their job to the utmost of their ability, and they're trusting me that I will do you know, my utmost ability to prevent that from happening. So trust. Trust that you know, one little mistake won't be the end of anything, okay? You know, I was taking a, a, a sales uh, le- course or lesson, and one of the sales, the trainer said about selling, he said, you know, there's not one, little, one thing that's going to kill a deal, okay? It's going to be a culmination of things. It's the same thing in life. It's not one thing that's going to make you a bad parent or make you a bad boss. It's going to be a culmination of things. I agree. But it's not going to be one thing. So trust. You know, it's not one event that's going to make you fail. So trust is very, very imp- important. We have this saying in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Marine Corps, and we used to say, don't sweat the little stuff. And that's exactly it. Don't sweat the little stuff. All right? Zoom out, meaning look at the bigger picture, and don't sweat the little stuff. Okay? You know? If you, if you do that, you'll be more obedient, okay? Because a lot of people who are disobedient sweat the little stuff, all right? That's what happens. They worry about the little stuff when they should be really worrying about the bigger picture and what's going on. Um, this is really important, and I think will really help out. Act as a team. And I want to talk about this real quickly And that is, you know, one of the biggest uh, issues in family life that we we really, really have, and this deals with obedience, is Ephesians 5, where it says, you know, wives, be subject to your husbands. Husbands are the head of the household, blah, 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 right? Especially in traditional Catholics and even in, in Protestant churches, they take this pseudo- ultimate literal sense and it's a shame because i find that most marriages fall apart when this happens unless you can find a, a, an extremely awesome wife it start falling apart why because what winds up happening is the woman takes the brunt of everything in the household and what winds up happening is the husbands abuse their this this line abuses their wives take for granted their wives and not only that but don't do anything because they're not being obedient at all that's really the essence of it is that they're not being obedient to the needs of their wives now i want to read ephesians 5 because ironically speaking ephesians 5 opens up with this sentence okay be subject to one another out of reference for Christ. I use the artist VCE version, all right? It says, be subject to one another. In other words, wives and, children, and, wives and husbands, you need to be subject to the other person. That's what he says. Read it, Ephesians 5, beginning of Ephesians 5. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself. Now, go down what the husband is supposed to do. Husbands, okay? It says, um, uh, let me see. Uh, okay. For no, okay, so husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church, right? For this, you know, so Christ uh, loves his church. So what did Christ do? Christ served the church, right? He healed. He fed them. He served his wife, right? He healed them. So to be like Christ is to serve our wives, right? Just like Christ did. Christ served his church. He died for his church, right? The upper room. He washed the disciples' feet. You say that I'm master. You say that I'm this great person. Yet, what have I shown you? That I'm going to wash your feet. That this great master of yours 
is a servant of all. To be great is to be a servant of all. So this is where obedience to our wives are so important. Because when our wives need our help, when our wives ask us to do things, we do them out of obedience. Why? As Christ served his church, we are to serve our wives, to give up our lives. But you know what? Oh, in a traditional marriage, you know, you look at it like, no, 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 no. The wives are just to serve the husband because we're the head of the household. You know? Yes, spiritually we are. So we should be vigilant. We need to protect our wives and our children spiritually to be vigilant. And one of the spiritual things we've got to worry about is, are they being obedient? And the greatest way of teaching our children how to be obedient is being obedient ourselves. Just like Jesus came to serve, just like Jesus washed the feet of his disciples to serve his disciples, to show them, look what I've done. You call me master, but I'm showing you to be a master is to serve. It's the same thing. So husbands, serve your wives. Wives, serve your husbands. That's what's important. Because obedience leads us to Holiness and is the entryway into humility. So let us end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to be obedient. Help us to be, have instant willing obedience to you that our will be united with your will in everything that we do as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Purified by Fire. Please visit us at purifiedbyfire.com. Like us at Instagram and Facebook at purified.fire. Sanctifying the world one soul at a time. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.